I think the Jesuits have it right in their approach to education. Cura personalis, the, the education of the whole person. And back in the day when Loyola was called Jesuit, and I was a student there, we really did uh, engage body, mind, spirit. There was a lot of athletics. We enjoyed those of us who were not Rocky Gia Wall State tackles, um, played t touch football and basketball and baseball and all kinds of sports. And it was just part of the ethos there, athleticism. Uh, and it was fun, uh, and even for those of us who are not naturally gifted athletes. It also mentally, uh, educating the mind, the courses at Jesuit were really rigorous uh, in the high school curriculum. There were some exceptions, but we really had teachers from Coach Cantonese to Mrs. Ely to Father Norbert, a Jesuit scholastic at first year, who took their subject seriously and really exacted the maximum effort from us and really uh, educated us. So, mental rigor, educational rigor, and then the place was uh, spiritual. Uh, there was from, from Father Foles and Logan putting the little water drops on an overhead and playing bridge over troubled water to get us to reflect on our lives to great theology classes by George Walcott and Ken Lurkey. There was just a pervasive sense that you really do need to pay attention to your spiritual life. So they got it right. For me, I, I uh, indicate there were three three aspects of my education that served me well throughout my career. First of all, the, the courses, the classes that focused on communication and how to interpret a text or an event. These are kind of continuous parts of the education. So Mrs. Ely's English class, Father Norbert English class, Father Welsh's Latin class, where we learned the structures of, of grammar and how to communicate in English. It was invaluable. Uh, and so something about writing and communication and elegance in those areas and clarity was really invaluable for me throughout my career. I, I turned out to be a professor, a teacher in college, and that was terrific. Um, also, I, I lift up the theology classes that I mentioned, the spirituality that really gave us a sense of purpose and meaning beneath and throughout the education and the formal curriculum. And then uh, one thing that was particularly formative for me and that I used throughout my life, we had something called the debate club. And it taught you how to make an argument and how to refute an argument and how to be creative in an argument. I remember Byron Ritchie, who I think went on to be a lawyer, uh, was a great debater and the topic was, shall the jury system be reformed, yes or no? Well, you crafted an argument that you would win the case with and he and his teammate crafted an argument that said, yes, the jury system should be reformed. How are we going to do it? Pump music into the deliberation room of the jury because here's the evidence that shows music makes you more rational and calculated and it won't cost much and it's a great thing. No one had any defense for that argument and they won the debate many times. I learned a lesson from that. So debating how to express yourself, how to make an argument, how to carry the argument home. So really, those are all very valuable aspects of Jesuit education. My favorite memories of the Jesuit were the characters, the people. Um, they were all so different, but they were prototypes, palimpsests, models for people I would meet for the rest of my life. I'm just going to use three examples for the sake of brevity. First, there's the type of person who things come easily, smooth, seemingly effortless, popular with the girls, great athlete, kind of witty, low-key and cool. You've met those people. Robert Pugh. Robert Pugh was, was like that. I imagine he still is. I remember one time we ever the whole class was up for grabs. There was a substitute teacher. Everyone was misbehaving. We were sitting in a quiet group just talking and the teacher, who was completely flummoxed, came up to us. We were the only group she could possibly communicate with. Everyone else was going wild in the class. She said, I invited you to stop talking and Pugh immediately shot up and said, RSVP no. Uh, that was Pew. Effortless, great baseball player, great athlete. I've met many like him since. A second person I mentioned is Glenn Robichaud, who was our valedictorian, as I recall. Glenn was a quiet, polite, efficient, smart, modest, humble guy who didn't call attention to himself, did his work, was quite brilliant, and absolutely likable. Meet those kinds. Third person I'll mention is Ken Zadig. We were all obnoxious in those days. Ken had his particular style of being obnoxious. 
and uh, he didn't fit in with every everyone else and people teased him and uh, made fun of him a lot and he was the editor of the yearbook and he he took the abuse and he gave it back he didn't he didn't shy away he was contentious and combative in a great way and he got his revenge for the people not liking him in our senior yearbook he put his own picture and face on the cover of the yearbook <laughs> So I, I took a lot from that example that I've always admired people who don't cave in and do their own thing. You're asking about Catholic education then and now. Let's use three metaphors to describe the way Catholics have educated people in this country over the last 50, 60 years. Enclaves, cocoons, and bridges. Enclaves. Back in the day in the 70s when I was a student at Jesuit, Right after the Second Vatican Council, we were moving from enclave to cocoon. An enclave would be a model where you build pretty strong walls around the community. You keep people in that community. They have their own lingo, their own uniforms, their own rituals, their own not eating meat on Friday. And you also keep other people out. Well, it builds solid community. You kind of know who you are. It's important. It nurtures a community, a subculture within a broader society. Jesuit, and still today, we have all these models today where you're kind of keeping others out, keeping people in. So we were a little bit of an enclave model in the 70s, but we were also at Jesuit a cocoon, meaning yes, you're a, a, a shelter, a protective sheath that's nurturing life, but the idea is you, you turn into a butterfly or whatever and you fly away and you, you're a beautiful creature, but you get nurtured for a while in order to, um, to go out into the broader society. Jesuit was also like that back in the day, and we have those models still today. The bridge model is you're educating people with an explicit intent to build a bridge from that enclave or that cocoon out into the broader world, into effect, to change that broader world. My memory is we didn't think as much about that back in the day, about how we're going to transform Nigeria or Washington, D.C. or New Orleans even, but, but more about who we were. And that maybe that's what a high school does. But the other model is you do that, you nurture, you know your identity, you wear your uniforms, you rah-rah Catholic and rah-rah Jesuit. But the idea is, and I think this is part of Jesuit education too, you go out and you build a bridge to non-Catholics, to people of all faiths and creeds and religion. That's also a model now. Catholic education, I think, has had a hard time over the years building those bridges, but I think we're getting a lot better at it.